Troy, you want to open up with prayer? I got to. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be in your house today, Lord. Let us let us all come with open minds and open hearts, Lord. We want to see you. That's the reason we're here, Lord. If you to be blessed by your word and, and study your your picture for us, Lord. These things we say in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, I don't know about y'all, but I'm enjoying this cooler weather. It's really nice. And it's supposed to be, I think, I, I read or saw it on the phone that it's supposed to be in the 60s as a high for the next two days. Well, that's going to be pretty cool. Anyway, um, I guess we need a song. Anybody got a suggestion for a song? 146. 146. Come and die. Stopped and met up with a lady and a couple and wound up having church with them till 2 30. Mm. And then we got home, sat down to rest and eat us some uh, bite of lunch and got a phone call about three o'clock. And another couple pulled in our driveway and we had church again. <laughs> praise the Lord. So Lord. I'm saying, Amen. praise God. <laughs> praise God. So keep them coming. So Vicki, right. you, Vicki, you gonna give an update? On what? On your <laughs> test? She did this morning. Yeah, did this morning. Did you not oh, hear she me? Did in the <laughs> <school>. <laughs> well, I knew she did in Sunday school, but I didn't hear her. I can't hear. <laughs> yes, there what? she is. Okay. Maybe, maybe I just forgot. No problem. <laughs> Anybody else with a testimony of Hallelujah? Now she can remind us. <laughs> 
Any questions? Anybody want to pay some uh, phone? We haven't done 13 in a long time. Let's do 13. That's a good one. 113? No, 13. 13. Just 13. You mean 12? 13. <laughs> oh, I was thinking about in the garden on it, but it's the 13 I should not be moved. That's a good one, too. Some of it is just not. Jesus is what's important. And, 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 and I think we can get too caught up in the study sometime, or I can, uh, to realize what the point is. Oh, the amen. Right. Be in obedient and, and, uh, and, and our Savior. Amen. Well, why don't we sing in the garden the next page over? Okay. Nice way. <laughs>
y'all didn't know, that's one of my favorite songs right there. And that was my mother's favorite song. It was it was sang at her her funeral. Anyway, any more testimonies? Well, I don't know about that. It's not a testimony, but I'd just like to say that I like that song because it's slow enough that I can keep up with the work. <laughs> so that means you're an old country boy. Well, I guess so. <laughs> All right, I thought you had something to say, Dave. Hey, well, you were great a while ago. Uh, well, well, that was about something else. But uh, years ago, my dad sang the gospel for you, and In the Garden is one of the songs they sang. And um, at the end, they put this little refrain on it, and I'm going to say it's real short. But as soon as they finished the last line of the last chorus, they continued that song with this. I trust in God, I know He cares for me. On mountains bleak or on the stormy sea, though billows roll, He keeps my soul. My heavenly Father watches over me. Amen. You know, one of the big blessings in this church is every one of y'all. I mean, this is a wonderful church, wonderful people in this church. And uh, is there any more testimonies? Well, we're blessed to have David Stewart here. He's going to bring some songs for us. <laughs> I just told him about that. We'll come back to that and get talk. I don't know if y'all have heard it, but he also has a testimony in what he does. You know, and you've seen him with the chain or the bracelets around his ankles and stuff like that. But he has a testimony about that. You might tell him what, what that means, because some of them probably don't know him. There's more witnessing to him now than they ever were anything else. But, but uh, they represent the sin that I used to be caught up in, right? They remind me what I was where Jesus took hold of me and what I would still be if he didn't hold on to me. I would be a, in the bondage of that sin that was literally owning my life at one time. Anyway, in that song, In the Garden, we have little booklets we used to go. We've been, since the COVID, we haven't gone, but we used to go to the Alzheimer's Alliance. And I would sing, we used to, my wife and I used to do it at the old folks' homes and when we lived in Hemet, because there was a lot of those. And <coughs> in the, there's like about 15 songs in each one of the little booklets, and we would pass them out so people could sing along. And the last song in every one is in the garden. <coughs> we had an incident with David and Pizza in or Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut, yeah. yeah. Had the police called on me. Yeah. I've had the police called on me three times. <laughs> one, one of our girls, young girls there saw yeah. them and they knew he's a skate <laughs> yeah. I thought he was eating too much pizza. Two cars and, and three cops showed up. Three. <laughs> yeah. Three of them. And uh, Every time they called the police on me, it was two cars and three cops. <laughs> hey, David. Vicky's had that experience. Who? Yeah, Vicky. Vicky? Oh, yeah. The cops showed up on her, too. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> she was. Well, did you take that time to witness to? I did. Uh, in fact, it, yeah. the second time it happened, it was in McGee, uh, Mississippi. I was on the way to Florida for Thanksgiving. Giving, and uh, Matt Hutton, Sutton, Matt Sutton was one of the police officers, and he shared the table with me, and we had lunch together. <laughs> <laughs> he was a Christian. Too. My point, I was going to say, will go to yeah. how just calm and, and undisturbed they just stood there. <laughs> well, the, the police were calling in, checking out his name, making sure there was no record, there was nothing going on. You know, I was, I'd already gone up there and explained to them what he was and what, what the shackles represented. And, but, you know, they have to do their job, they have to check it out and everything. But, it's pretty uh, funny they checked all that out and they didn't know I was packing a pistol on <laughs> <laughs> They were just standing there just as calm and peaceful and everything, had a little grin on his mouth. Yeah. It is kind of amusing. <laughs> I mean, no kind of jail or police place or anything that has shackles like these. Sure. <laughs> you know, if, I, if I was running from the cops or had something to hide, I would hardly walk into Pizza Hut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. 
Yeah. This young girl's in her 20s. You know, <laughs> all the things she's ever seen is in a movie somewhere yeah. or something. It's pretty amusing music. Huh? Anyway, people are funny. We are all funny. God, we know God has a sense of humor, right? Absolutely. He made us. <laughs> <laughs> Out on the highways and byways of life, many are weary and sad. Carry the sunshine where darkness is right, making the sorrowful black. Make me a blessing, make me a blessing out of my life. May Jesus shine, make me a blessing, oh say. Christianity 
is, is on airwaves. And he was talking about uh, spiritual awakening in the United States of America. And a lot of people are already wondering during this pandemic and, and beyond why we haven't seen a great onslaught <coughs> of spiritual awakening. And did you know this man, and he, did, he was on radio now, and he got a television show, but he blamed our lack of spiritual awakening on us presenting the gospel over their airwaves and taking away all personal contact Amen, and lifestyle. Amen. And the way he, he supported what he thought was he brought up communist China. Let me tell you what, in the last few years there have been 100 million Christians in communist China. One, a third of the size of the population of the United States of America in the last 20 years in communist China. And he said, I got to thinking about that and I got to praying about that. They can't broadcast in China. They can't get on their telephones in China and promote Jesus Christ. They can't get on television and promote Jesus Christ. They can't get on a computer and promote Jesus Christ. Well, listen, they can't even publicize that they got a church house and promote Jesus Christ. So how in the world is a hundred million people come to know Jesus without all of that? Neighbor to neighbor to neighbor. They saw something different about the person next door and they wanted to know what made them different from everybody else. And they would share with them Jesus Christ and tell them he made a difference in my life. And that neighbor says, I want some of him. I want to know him. And then the next neighbor, and the next neighbor, and the next neighbor, and the relatives. And now they're still trying to kill them over there for it. Amen. A hundred million Christians in communist China without radios, televisions, computers, without electronics. Just simply because people showed what it meant to live for Jesus Christ. Fastest growing church in the world is in Iran. Yes, sir. Growing in Iran right now. They have the same thing. They kill them over there for that. But what's happening? They're seeing the change. They're seeing the change. You want revival in America? Which time the church stood up and let them see the change. Amen. Let them see Jesus. And let them say, I want some of that. And that's where we got to go. If we want it. It was amazing what, what he said and it just made so much sense. Now let's get to, to our study tonight. This morning, you know, we talked to heard a message on the New Testament or the New Covenant, uh, 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 that it was a will. The, the, uh, the Gospels was actually a will. Jesus Christ, the testator and the mediator and, uh, and uh, between us and God uh, concerning uh, those who through him uh, will be the beneficiaries. And those, as we said this morning, that uh, her, whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life will be the beneficiaries of the will of Christ. And, and you know what? We are relatives. He said that we are, uh, we are brothers with him. We uh, are adopted to him. We have rights to him with the same rights that, uh, that Jesus Christ had by inheritance. And so we have a, a part in the will uh, of Jesus Christ. And so, you know, when you think about that, you know, you have to let that sink in. Well, you, how many of you have got rich relatives that put you in a, a will? <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing I had to worry about, I don't have any rich relatives for one thing. Uh, but if I did uh, and they put me in their will, I'd just about pass out. And so it's a rare thing that anybody be... Uh, a relative of somebody very wealthy and get put in their will. Uh, but but you know what? We we are in the will of the King of Kings. Amen. We're in the will of the Lord of Lords. We're in the will of the one who owns the cattle of a thousand hills. 
we're in, the, we're in the will of the one who everything belongs to. Everything was created by him. I am. Without him, nothing was made. He owns it all. And we're in his will. <laughs> ain't that great? Amen. Boy, let that sink into your brain for a minute and worry about what you ain't got. Amen? Just think about what you got, what you do have. And so I want to use the scripture from Hebrews this morning that, uh, that I read to you in chap and, uh, ha uh, Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, verse uh, 14, and I'm going to do something that I don't, I rarely ever do. We're going to dissect. Now, that's not what they called it in grammar <laughs> in high school. Uh, what did they call it? Huh? Depict. They called it diagram. Yeah, a diagram. Diagram the sentence. Yeah. Well, we're going to dissect this one because <laughs> I couldn't remember what diagram, the word diagram. And I was horrible at diagramming sentences. Did y'all ever remember that? Mm -hmm. They made you write the sentence. You had to draw a line down underneath it. And you had to write where it was a verb or an adverb or a noun. I never did know the difference between any of those words. The adjectives, connect, conjunctions. It's a word. I can't even remember what they called them. But I knew what they called them, but I didn't know which one was which. So it didn't make any difference. I always got big red marks and X's on them. So anyway, we're going to dissect this sentence, uh, this verse. And let me read it to you. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit of, uh, offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works. Now here's what he was talking about about China. To serve the living God. <coughs> to serve the living God. To serve the living God is to let people see Christ in you and to serve him in obedience. So we're going to look at this and we're going to break it down. Uh, the, the, in, in, in parts of the of the of the of verse, and the first part is how much more shall the blood of Christ? And we'll just stop there. And uh, Melissa, you got First John chapter uh, one verse seven. Would you read that scripture for me? That if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. All right. So how much more shall the blood? What does the blood do? According to the scripture in 1 John, it cleanses us from all sin. Amen? Now, it, it, and it's not an automatic thing. We keep saying that. And, and you can go to Romans 3 and 25, and it tells you that all your past sins when you're saved are what, he, what has been forgiven. All your, your sins, future sins, <laughs> must be confessed, but it still is forgiven the same exact way. It will be covered in the blood of Christ. And there's a lot, of, I don't know why Christian people live in sin and, and keep sin in their lives for so long. Because the Bible said here, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, why would you want to carry the burden of sin with you? I carried the burden of sin with me when I was lost. I carried it until I got saved. And I look back on that and I hate that time that I lived for the, for the devil and neglected the salvation offered to me in Christ. And so when I got the salvation of Jesus Christ, when I would sin, I would feel bad. And, and you know, I'll be, I'll be the first to admit there was sometimes I'd get so angry or so mad or frustrated that it would cause me to sin. And, and until that anger subsided, I couldn't be forgiven. I wouldn't ask Him to forgive me. Am I the only one that that happens to? Bob. <laughs> <laughs> You wouldn't know when we had that, but all those that would be honest would, they would say amen to that. But you know what? We take a, a risk because when we get forgiven for those sins, don't, don't it don't make you feel better? Amen. And sometimes that, that forgiveness requires you asking someone else to forgive you for what you said to them. That's the part I really don't like. Amen. But it's something that's necessary. But sometimes it's a personal sin. Where you, it's just between you and God. And why we carry those alone? Why we think we're hiding from God and doing something that God don't see? I don't know why we ever think those things. But anyway, this is what the blood of Christ. How much more shall the blood of Christ? That's something to think about. The power is in the blood. It is a wonder, that song, wonder work in power. It never loses its power. It never does. And it can take any sin and wash it white as snow. 
and when you get the forgiveness, it's gone, it's over with, it's never remembered anymore. God's forgotten it because you've asked Him to forgive you. Amen? Amen. That's the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. We need to take full advantage of that power every day. Every time we sin, we need to take advantage of that power. You know what? It's not a matter of if we're going to sin. It's a matter of when we're going to sin. Amen? Amen. Because we're not perfect. Amen. We don't have to be perfect, and it's, it's something we need to strive to be. But we don't have to be. You know why? Because Christ was perfect. Amen. He was the only one that ever was. Only one. So because of his perfection, we can have <laughs> forgiveness by the blood of Jesus Christ, by his own blood. So the, the, then let's look at, uh, at, at, the, at the, other, the rest of this. It says, how much more shall the blood of, of Christ, and, and then it says, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Brother Gary, you got Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 6. Did you read, 3 through 6. Would you read that for me, please? Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are you also the called of Jesus Christ. Okay, so it says, he's talking about the Son, the Son Jesus Christ, which was made, what, what was the throne, the kingship, that was granted to Jesus, where did it come from? It came from God, but it was a promise made to some other king. Who was that other king? It was David. It was David. He, God, the, you know what? I got to thinking about those kings today. And, and there was, uh, actually, yeah, it was this morning. I got to thinking about those kings. David was the only king that was called a man after God's own heart. Was he a sinner? He sure was. But there was one thing about David. Whenever his sin found him out, what did he do? He repented. He humbled himself before God. And time after time, he put himself in the mercy of God. Remember the time God told him, okay, I'm going to give you a choice. Remember when he sent the prophet to him? And he said, I'm gonna, he gave him three choices. And you remember what David said? I'm not going to choose any of them. I'm going to let God punish me the way he sees fit. And the only thing he ever said, just don't put me in the hands of my enemies because he knew they wanted him dead real bad. So did God. And so he trusted God. He was a man after God's own heart. And Jesus Christ, because of that, God made a promise to David that his, his kingship, that there would be a, a, an eternal kingship given to him and his throne would be occupied eternally by somebody. Did you know that's the reason Israel survived up until the time of Christ? Did you know that was one of the main reasons they were completely annihilated and destroyed? It wasn't because they didn't have them in captivity that they couldn't have just killed every one of them and been done with it. The Lord always preserved a remnant because of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen? Now he's got a remnant still. He's got, they became a nation. It was promised when you read Jeremiah and Isaiah. It was promised to them. And, and you know, you read that and you think, well, that happened during this time and that happened. No, it didn't. They were, they were never a free nation. They went from one captivity right into another one until this, this last century when they became a nation again. For the first time, a free nation. Yeah. And so this is when this time came. And so he said, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. He was born of a woman, and he was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, <coughs> by the resurrection from the dead. And, and that scripture while ago said, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Jesus offered himself and he had the power and the might of the Spirit. Remember the Trinity of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Through the power of the Holy Ghost, 
Jesus had the same power that we are allowed to have dwelling in us today. Amen? And this power caused him to want to die, to give himself a ransom for us. And we have been redeemed by his blood that he shed for us and through his death. Amen? And his death came by bleeding to death on the cross. He died there and, and he, he shed his blood for us. But he said by the resurrection from the dead, it would have been absolutely worthless had he not risen from the dead. Amen. Amen. That's right. It would have been absolutely worthless had he not risen from the dead. His death would have been in vain. Our religion today would be in vain if it weren't for the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. How many of you believe you're going to be resurrected? Praise God. Amen. You know what? That's what keeps us going. That's what keeps us from fearing death. Why would I be afraid of death? I'm going to go when I die. I'm going to go right straight into glory. And if the resurrection of this ugly, funky body of mine is going to be raised and given new life, Go to have a perfect body. My soul's going to be restored to it. And I'm going to be the best looking one there. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the church house. I'll be much, much better looking than Kim. <laughs> you mean you go have her? Yeah, well, I might. Or you might be bald headed. Who knows? But by the resurrection, because this has all happened through the eternal spirit, and I like that eternal, because when the spirit of God dwells in you, guess how long that happens? Eternal. Amen. Amen. It's eternal. The eternal spirit offered himself without, without spot to God. He became that sinless sacrifice by whom we have received grace and apostleship. Amen. We have been given grace in order to follow him and share him with other people. Amen. That's what apostleship does. We are his apostles that we are supposed to go out in his name for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. That's who we're supposed to be. That's what the Chinese have right now in their Christian population. That's what they're doing. They're doing it face to face, door to door. Now a lot of them are dying. A lot of them, the government has figured this out and they have set traps for them where they send government, communist government agents out and try to pursue someone that they feel like is a Christian and get them to tell them about Christ so they can imprison them. Amen? Y'all don't think we're blessed to live in the United States of America. Amen. Amen. But what are we doing with our freedom? Nothing. Wasting it. Are we using our freedom and our liberty as a reason to sin? Is that what we're doing? God help us. He said here, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations. We've been called, we've been saved to obey God. Amen. And to show our faith and to live our faith and to walk in the light. It, Missy read about all you want first John. That's what it means to walk in the light, to walk in faith and obedience to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ walked in faith and obedience to the Father in heaven. Amen. He walked that way. Even to death. Even to death. He walked that way. Alright, let's look at the next one. So he says, How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Now listen to this. He did this to purge your conscience. To purge your conscience. Uh, Jody, you've got Hebrews chapter 10 verses 21 through 25. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse <coughs> us from guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with the pure water, let us hold unswaveringly to the <coughs> hope we have we we profess, for he who <coughs> promised 
is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more of us you all of all the more as you see the day approaching. Now I had the last two verses added to this on purpose because of that last verse. Uh, you got another one to read? Is there another one? No, that was it. Twenty-five. That was all. It. Thank you. Uh, so he, he, what what he says here by purging your conscience means that he takes your conscience that's guilty and he purges it and makes it clean and useful. How many of you have ever had a guilty conscience? <laughs> Boy, somebody going to have a yeah, yeah. Yeah. How do you feel when you got a guilty conscience? You feel yucky, don't you? Makes you feel yucky. And so he says that because we have a high priest, who is our high priest? Jesus, Jesus Christ is mm -hmm. our high, listen to me, he's the only priest we need. Amen. 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 He's the only priest we need. If, if he can't get it done for you, there's no sense in, in going to one with flesh and blood because he certainly can't help you any. He ain't going to help you none. You know why? Because the high priest that we have over the house of God, now y'all hear that? And having a high priest over the house of God. What's, what is the house of God? Oh, it's the church, isn't it? The church. The church is the body of believers. The church is the body of Christ. The church is made up of individuals, so uh, people are the church. But it says that he is a high priest over the body, over the house of God, over the church. Amen? Amen? He's over the church. So he says, since you have a high priest like this, what does he tell you to do? Draw near to him. How? With a pure heart. Let me tell you what, God don't accept half-heartedness. He wants, you, you either give him all or you give him nothing. Amen? That's the way God looks at it. And y'all, we have too many half-hearted Christians today. They can't figure out which side of the fence they want to walk on. Amen? So what do they do? They do this tightrope. That's unacceptable to God. God wants you, he said, let us draw near with a true heart or a pure heart. And then when you do that, he gives you something. He gives you assurance. He wants you to be assured in your faith. John wrote in, in 1 John, there, there's, there's, there's verses in, in 1 John where he says, I know, you must know that we can know, and you got to know, you got to have the full assurance of your salvation. If you don't have the full assurance of your salvation, you need to get to the place in your life with Christ that you have the full assurance of your salvation. I tell people all the time, and they'll say, well, do you think so-and-so saved? That's not my call. Amen? Amen? That's not my call. You remember what Jesus told, told those scribes and Pharisees? He said, there's going to be harlots and thieves enter into the kingdom of God before you do. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, he said. So we don't have the right to make that judgment and cast that judgment on anybody. Now, we can look at their lives and say, my goodness, why don't they live that way? You can do that. And, you, and we oftentimes do that. We do judge that way. But he said, I want you to draw to near to me with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Amen? Now that word sprinkled, if you notice from our, our uh, scriptures this morning, where the blood of Christ was sprinkled on the altar in the day of Moses, it was also sprinkled on the book. It was sprinkled on the people. Why? 
because the sprinkling, just the sprinkling, Troy, of that blood on them sanctified them. Amen. Amen. You know what I mean? They became fit for the use of God. Amen. That's what it meant. And so, and so we need to understand that this, that so we need to be sprinkled, our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, not sprinkled to continue in evil. Not what it says. And our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Why? It gives a reason. Because he is faithful who promised. Amen. You can live for Christ and you're going to receive the promises. And you can rest assured what He promised you, you're going to get. Amen? Do you believe that? That is having the full assurance of faith, by the way, that you believe that every promise of God is yea and amen. That means if He promised it, you'll get it. If He promised it with condition, you have to meet the condition to get the promise. But some of his promises are without condition. And those are good too. Amen. 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 And so we have, to, we have to look at it. So he says, I want you because he is faithful that has promised. So we've got to hold fast to our profession. Because Jesus Christ is interested in those who serve him, who live for him. He don't want us to live for him a few years and quit. <laughs> Amen. He wants us to continue a lifestyle of walking with him, following him, living for him. And then he said, he said after that, after we can do that, he said, then let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. We are supposed to challenge each other to do good. That's what our challenge should be. You know, in the New Testament, in the, in the New Testament church, one of the things that we're absolutely not commanded to do was something that they did. They took this challenge very, very seriously, didn't they? You know how I know? Because those people got to selling their land, got to selling their houses, and bringing the money to the apostles, and tell them, he said, and they said, if you've got any people in need, give this to them. Now think about that. Now, a lot of people think that they sold the houses and the land they lived on. That's not what it, the, the meaning of that. There's a, you know, how many of y'all got the land beside the house you got it on? Or, or you got access to other, another house, maybe through inheritance or what? These people was taking what they weren't living in and what they weren't using to, to, to uh, live off of and sold it and helped <coughs> someone else. Amen? and took a burden off of them in poverty and, and helped them where they could actually serve in the kingdom work and be of good. Now that don't mean that somebody that don't have any money can't serve God. Amen? But that's what they did. And that's what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. Remember, they lied about how much money they got. Amen? And so he says, uh, so let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works and then he makes this statement, I wanted to share this with y'all, to not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Amen. Amen. Now, you know what that scripture tells us? Go to, Go to church. Amen. Because the building here, and what we're doing right now, is the assembling together of God's people. This is exactly what he's talking about. He said, so, he said, for not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. That's what we're doing here tonight in this study, and we'll be doing it Wednesday night in this study. We'll be exhorting one another to do better for Christ. This is where we come to hear that. Amen? This is what this is all about. And I just would to God that, that people could get a grasp on that. And, and actually do that. If, it, if people would, if, you know what, if everybody that I talk to that claimed to be a Christian went to church every Sunday, we'd have to build some bigger churches. <laughs> but you know why we don't have bigger churches than the churches we have on full? Because they forsake the assembling of themselves together. And that's not scriptural. That's not by design. That's not by desire of God. Amen. 
And it shows, I think, what we just talked about previously to that, that they're lacking in some of these things. They're lacking in following Jesus with a true and a whole heart. Because if you follow Christ with a true and a whole heart, you're going to be a part of His church. Amen. you believe that? Amen. This is His church. He's coming back for the church. Amen? I want to be a part of that, don't you? Amen. And so we, we've let people get by with being, a, they can say, well, I'm a member of this church. You know, it's funny, and I'm going to have to, I, I'm going to have to move on to this, I know. But it's just funny, since I got called to preach, and I talk to people a lot, and, and I'll say, well, uh, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, where do you go to church? Well, I go, I go, I'm just using Piney Grove for an example, because the first one is, I'm, I'm not talking about anybody from Piney Grove, I'm just throwing it in there, because they would tell me, well, I, I remember over Piney Grove, well, really? Well, what about brother so-and-so? I don't know them. Well, really? Well, when's the last time you went to church over there? Oh, 20, 25 years ago. <laughs> well, you haven't gone anywhere else since? No, I'm not much on church going to church. And they feel like they don't have to. There's something wrong with that. I'm not their judge, but there's something wrong with that. Amen? And y'all, I run into this over and over and over and over and over. Their wants and desires above God's. Yeah, and sometimes they won't even tell you to remember nothing. They'll just say, oh, I'm a Christian. How do you know? I'm just saying. Hmm. I'm a good person. Well, That's being a I'm Christian, saying. yes, ma'am. I'm a good person, they say. Yeah, a good person don't get You're you welcome that. to your your beliefs, and I honor that. But I'm a good person. I just I just don't want to have anything to do with that. That's right. I've been but, told that more times than that. Being a good person ain't one of the qualifications to give me glory. No, it's not. Knowing Christ Jesus. Commitment. Amen. You know what we're here. Commitment. That's commitment. They're scared of commitment. Yeah, yeah, it's a commitment. Yes, I bought somebody. Y'all are itching now. I got you itching. Yeah, yeah. there's something wrong too with going to church because you think you got to. Yeah. Yeah. You ought to be going because you want to. Amen. Especially if you're talking about the old boy that is changed, you know. And when you accept Christ, you're changed. You want to go to church. Right. Every time something's going on, if you can, you know. Mm -hmm. That's part of it. I like Melissa's philosophy. <laughs> I've stolen it from her. <laughs> I get to go. Yeah, there you go. Hallelujah. You I go. get to go. Yeah, every time I've missed, whether it be migraine or my back's out, I always miss something amazing. And I hate missing church. You know, when I've gone on vacation, I'm like, I've got to watch the video because I know something amazing. Always something amazing happens. And I just don't like to miss. Amen. You know, look, just look. And, you know, like... Uh, this morning, that young man came forward and surrendered his life to, to Christ. It was made. He got saved on the 26th. And he, he had told Brother James about it. Dad told me about it. And uh, I was wondering when he was going to come do this. And it was amazing. He was sitting back there this morning crying. And Brother James got up there and walked up there and grabbed him by the arm. Come on. And, and that's, that's what we have to do. It, it's kind of like spurring. That's what he says right here. He says we have to consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Sometimes you just got to give somebody a, a, a godly shove, take them by the hand, give them a nudge. Just you know what? I don't I don't advise this unless the Spirit really lays it on your heart. But when the Spirit lays it on your heart, you see somebody over there just squalling and bawling, and you know what? A lot of people don't know what to do. That's right. They're so unchurched, they don't know what to do when they feel what they feel. And sometimes, a loving, caring Christian, by faith, can walk over there and say, let's go up here and pray. Yep. And there's been a lot of people saved that way. Yep. Just because somebody provoked them just a little bit. And that word provoke don't mean you're going to punch them and push them and do them. That's not what I mean. It just says, lend a helping hand. That's what this word means here. Courage. Amen. 
that, that, and do it. Make sure it's in the spirit, because you can get in trouble if you just take it on yourself. Well, I think so and so needs saved. I think let's go ahead and drag them to the altar. That's not the way that works. I mean, that'll, that'll lead only to, to something bad. We got to move on. Thank y'all for your input. And so we then we talked about uh, uh, the purging of, of the of the conscience. And uh, now we're going to talk the, the purge of conscience from dead works. Now, dead works, uh, to me, is works that's not done for the glory of God that has nothing to do with the kingdom work. Amen? Any work that futters the kingdom work of God or glorifies our Savior is a good work. Anything that don't do that, no matter how much society thinks, oh, what a blessed thing, it don't mean squat in the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. So, uh, Jeremiah, you got 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13 through 15. Every man's work shall be manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, mm -hmm. and the fire shall try every man's work, of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now, whether y'all recognize this or not, this is actually happening at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And what he's looking at is the works. Don't have anything to do with your salvation. There ain't nobody but saved people going to be there. Now this is the difference between the, the judgment seat of Christ and the white throne judgment. Only the people who are saved are at the judgment seat of Christ. And this has not got to do whether you're going to go to heaven or not. It's going to have to do with the reward you have when you get there. Amen? Amen? It's going, to, it's going to determine, and remember I told you a while back, whether you like it or not, there's going to be a pecking order even in glory. Yep. <laughs> there's going to be one. And guess what determines your spot in that pecking order? The works that you do for the glory of God. And, he, and it's really plain uh, about uh, the, the way he puts this here. Uh, that uh, if, if uh, because he, see, he says if any man's work abide, in other words, if it survives the fire which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Okay? Now he's saved, and everybody else is saved. Remember that. But he said here, if any man's work shall all be burned up, if it shall be burned up, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved. Boy, this just burns some people up that believe you can lose your salvation. Absolutely. It just tears them up. Amen? Because a lot of people believe if you say you're saved and you, and you don't have the works, then you ain't got the good. And it's easy for all of us to declare that. Even Baptists think that sometimes. Amen? But according to this, when a man is saved, or a woman is saved, and his works are, are at the judgment seat of Christ, and it says if his works are burned up, he will suffer loss. Now, how in the world are you going to suffer loss in glory? I've heard people say, man, if I just get there, I might have a little smoke on me. I just won't get there. That's a wrong. You don't talk about the uh, going to uh, wrong attitudes about going to church. That's a wrong attitude to have about your Christian life. Amen. 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 Yeah, and, and so what we we're in we're in the, the the a society that likes to get something for nothing. That's the kind of society we live in. I want to go do as little work as I humanly can and make as much money as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. Amen. That, that's the, that's the attitude that we have. That's not so with the kingdom of God. Amen? We, we, we don't need to go to, to our Christianity and, and go before God with the attitude, I did exactly what it took just to get here. Because that's what these people are going to have. The minimum. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yep. No reward, but they're saved. That means they're on the bottom of the totem pole there. 
They have no, they have no incentive to be anywhere else. Now, why would anybody want to live like that or, or, or mimic that? Can you imagine, Todd, what it's going to be like when we get to the judgment seat of Christ? Let's see, I, I, I don't know if Paul's got a last name or not, the Apostle Paul, but I hope I ain't behind him. <laughs> Amen? Amen. <laughs> I, I hope I'm not behind him. Because it's going to be embarrassing. There's some people that are going to be so rewarded because of their works and what they gave up and what they did for the glory and the kingdom of God. Don't you think part of the part of the pay is here and that's well done though? Oh yeah. I think that's priceless. If I, if I could hear that, I I would live in a little cottage down by the creek. Amen. Amen. And you think about it, there's also going to be little children that ain't had a life of works to do that are going to be there. Okay? And so this is just a beautiful scripture here that shows us what it means for our conscience to be uh, 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 purged from these dead works. These dead works will not gain you anything. Not in this life or the next one. Amen? Only those things done for the glory of God. And when Jesus said, store up yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and, uh, and rust do not corrupt, this is what he's talking about. You're not going to send your money ahead. <laughs> That's going to be worthless there. You're not going to leave money there. Amen? Brother Gary, are you just saying, I'm trying to get this across, are you just saying that someone who accepts Christ, they believe that He you know, came and died and rose again, but they, then that's it. They don't do anything. How can you just not do anything else and really believe that? There are, there are some people who can work in the church. That they're, they're, they're good workers. They're dependable. You know, and, and, and see, he's not talking about laying the carpet, working in the building. No. And there's a lot of people that live their life and they think as long as I do the work around the church, I'll come over the yard every week. Well, if you're doing that for the glory of God, that's one thing. But if you're just doing it because nobody else does, it, that's another thing. If you're just doing it because you ain't got the money to pay them, that's a whole different ball game. And or I'm going to pay my tithes every week. I'm religiously going to pay my tithes. But I'm not doing it for the glory of God. I'm doing it because it's just something. Somebody said, well, I just come, some people just come to church because they think that's what they're supposed to do. And that ain't good either. What you said, Todd. Well, do you think they're truly saved? According do, to this, they can be. They can be truly saved and they do things for Christ, but they're not doing the kingdom work of Christ. Because the kingdom work of Christ is to see the hungry fed, to take care of the widows, to take care of the orphans, to see people come to know Jesus Christ, to witness and testify to people. And those are sometimes are the things we put on the back burner because those are the hardest things to do for some people. And it's easier for some people to come <coughs> up and just do other things instead of doing that right there. Does that make sense to anybody? It makes sense. And it's all about the judge. You, you wouldn't be right comparing yourself to Paul. Jesus is comparing Paul to Paul, Paul to him, and, <laughs> and you That's to right. him. So a little bit of work for somebody in God's eyes may be a lot. Yeah. It's, it's about the judge, not what right. we think about works are. It says the first will be last and the last will be first. Yeah. It's like the woman that gave it all. You know, she didn't have right. nothing, a whole lot. She just had a little bit, and she gave it all. She gave everything she had, right. but she gave it sincerely. She gave it with her whole heart versus somebody that's working in the church or doing something in the church, and they go in there and, it's, boy, i got to do this today. They're doing it for the wrong reason type thing, and they're not doing it. I get to do it. They, they've got to do it. Well, I'll give you an example. We, when I went to church this morning, we had an account set up for the youth men, and they were youth ministers. They had a little old set of twins there that they lived on a fixed income. They were with us. Uh, they weren't with us. They were old mates. They'd never been married. And, and they lived uh, there close to the church. And when every time the youth were fixing to go do something, 
and I never could tell one from the other. That's how, that's how twin they were. They would walk up to me with a little napkin <laughs> and they hand that to me. I said, Brother Gary, we want you to use that for these young people. And they'd walk, that's all they'd say. And I'd open it up and it'd be money. They didn't have money to give. But they believed in the work of the Lord for our children and our young people. And they gave that for the glory of God and for the glory of His King. They didn't want, nobody saw that but me. They didn't want anybody to know it. But God knew it. And that's the same thing about that woman that gave a little bit and everybody else was given a lot. She gave all she had. She gave everything. And when a person gives to the extent that they don't have it to give, but they give it anyway because of their heart, God loves a cheerful giver. He loves that. Amen. Amen. He loves that. Brother Sam, do you have something to say? I was a little saying, maybe others have heard it too. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's it. That's all that's going to last. Everything else is going to burn in the fire. Yes, sir. Brother Gary, I want to tell them about what I was texting a gentleman yesterday. I hadn't really met him, but he uh, moved to this area from New York and, and six months ago. And I, and I asked him, I said, do you have a... a church home. He said, no. I said, you've been going to church? No. And he said that he uh, that he was, is Catholic. I, I invited him to this church. Now he hadn't been going to, hadn't found a church home in six months been living over here and, and he told me that he's an ordained preacher. Alright. He said that his wife is from Hong Kong and that she's Buddhist. And he said, I don't try to push my religion on my wife and children. Now this is a guy that says he's a man of God. And he don't, and he's not living it. You know, and he, uh, and he was using language in, in his text that I, don't, that I don't speak. And so, you know, this is a, a man that's claiming to be a Christian that is not doing anything. <clears throat> But he says he's an ordained preacher. And what does that tell us? If I may say something to your question, and this, again, my opinion. I don't want to step on or on anybody. But Jesus said, at the time of your salvation, you are promised a place in heaven. If you, if you get in there and study it, you'll see that. You are, at the time of salvation, you are promised a place in heaven. If these people are truly saved, you know, at the, at the time of salvation, they're promised a place in heaven. They haven't done any works. <clears throat> but you, you should be, the Holy Spirit should drive them to the works. That's the point of it. So all I can say, and I can't judge what they have done, what they haven't done. If they are truly saved, they have a place in heaven no matter what works they have done. And that's the point of the uh, judgment seat of Christ. Now these people in the judgment seat of Christ are saved people. They're going to heaven. But this is determining their, their place in heaven and their reward in heaven. What it's all about. Yes, sir. Uh, going back to Piney Grove, I used to be a deacon there. And I can tell you the problem there. If they didn't let God run it, they let certain people in God must reign and be supreme in his church. Right. We must follow Christ. We are not allowed to lead him. Amen. Right. Any church. Let's do the last one and we got to close. Uh, Romans uh, 6 verses 17 and 18. The finish of this verse is uh, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So let's uh, have Romans 6, 17 and 18 please. But God be thanked that ye were the servant of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of the righteousness. 
there's two things here you need to, to take note of. That, uh, that you were the servant of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart. That there the heart is again. Brother Sam and I have talked about this before. When you're saved, you, you have a heart transformation. It must happen. Your innermost being, your inner man, has got to change. And then it says that uh, when you do this, and you've been made, made free from sin, now you become the servant of righteousness. But I'm going to close on this. Because <coughs> Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, it's a very familiar scripture to all of us about our salvation. And and, uh, and to get uh, add to what you just said, that people can't be saved, and their works may not show it, but they can still be saved. That is a mystery of God that, that, that we have. It says, For grace you are saved through faith, and not that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So you're saved by grace, through faith, not of works. Amen. So Brother Jerry, about that, you know this, uh, he said that he don't want to lead his family to, to his religion. But if you're a man of God and you believe there's only one God, and that if you don't believe in in God and heaven, well then, how can you allow your family and their children to go to hell? Amen. Yeah, if you believe that Christ is the only way to heaven and your family is trying to go another way, it's your duty to tell them they're not going that way. I understand that. But, but we're not saved by works, lest any man should boast. Now listen to this, because that's where we usually stop. For we are his workmanship after salvation created in Christ Jesus unto good works so we're not saved by our works but we are saved to do good works is what he's telling us here which God has before ordained that we should walk in them now this choice of word and I hate to get down to one word but notice he put the word should should that's the way it should be. Are there other people saved that don't do good works? From the judgment seat of Christ, I'd say absolutely. Yeah. You know, Brother, Brother Gary talked about this guy he talked to, talked about his religion. There's a difference in religion and Christianity. Yeah. Right. The religion is trying to, man trying to get to God and please God. But being a Christian, having a Christian is important. Right. And the scripture also tells us that all those who say, Lord, Lord, will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. It says many. Y'all have enjoyed tonight, enjoyed the conversation tonight, and all things got to come to a close. We've been here a while. Who would you stand, please? <coughs> so this is the scripture uh, text today and the study for today. Uh, has said a lot of things. I don't know where it said to you, but it said a lot of stuff to me about who Christ is. The great, great, we just, we just can't comprehend in our mind what he accomplished by his death and his resurrection. And, and by that, who he became according to the prophecy of God that was preordained for, from centuries all the way up till then, that it was told us who he would be, where he would come from, where he would be born, what he would do, what he looked like, and what he came to accomplish. And every bit of that was accomplished in Jesus Christ. <coughs> and it's not over, y'all, because the prophecies continue why? Because he came the first time, he coming again. <laughs> so our work is to do whatever it takes to get there with him. And y'all, let me go ahead and tell you another one. That ain't all of it. Then it turns to Israel. And you can see the thing going on in Israel right now, and you can see God forming, bringing his plan so it can be accomplished. You can see it. If you study the Word of God, you'll see it coming. What things that are going on there right now are just mind-boggling to everybody around us. They can't believe 
the things that are being accomplished right now with Israel. Things that they thought would never, ever happen. We're seeing them happen right now. You know why? That's why I believe that the Lord's coming soon. Yes. Because one of these days, the church is going to go. Yes. He ain't even going to put his foot on this ground. He's coming in the air. We're going to meet him up there. And then the full attention to all prophecy is going to pinpoint on that little bitty nation. In the middle of all the Arabs, that nobody can figure out how in the world they're still here. But here they are. Why? Because they were the people of promise. God's chosen. God's elect. And His plan for them is for them to know the Messiah, the one we already know. And it ain't going to stop till then. They're going to recognize Him one day, just like we do. And they're going to say, oh God, forgive us. We have killed our Savior. We have killed our Messiah. And all the armies of the world are going to be gathered around them to destroy them. And they're going to get to that wailing mall and they're going to cry out and they're going to say, Jesus, come. He is. There's a lot in this word. A lot I don't understand. But our part is not to worry about Israel. Our part is to worry about us, the Gentile church, the saints of God who are going to come to Him. Thank y'all so much for being here tonight. And I know it's been a long time, a long service, but for the input, thank you for the input and the, the, the things that you had to say and the questions that you had to ask. Amen. You'll never know the answer to a question until you ask it. Amen. Amen. I love y'all. Y'all have a great week. And don't get to pray for one another. And uh, <laughs> the tonight service starts at 6 o'clock right here. We're in the book of Exodus chapter... Seven. Er, I should know that, but I don't. <laughs> Amen. 27. 27. Amen. Chapter 27. God bless you all. Thank you. Brother Sam, would you dismiss us, please? Our Father, once again, we do thank you for the teaching and preaching of your word. Father, do send ourselves from service to service. We just ask that you always give us the ears to hear and talk to understand your word. We're willing to examine our hearts and what we profess in, in relationship to what your word has to say. And give us warnings in your word to make us call an election sure to examine ourselves whether we're in the faith or not. So, Lord, help us always to examine ourselves in relationship to your word. Father, just because a person professes to know God, but yet there's, uh, you look over on the heart, Father, please. you know the heart of everyone. Lord, just pray that you bless and meet all the needs of everyone's on prayer list. There's many of them that may be having health problems, you know who they are, whatever their needs are. Bless and forgive us for we fail you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.